We want to tell you good morning. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start uh, our uh, island on Euclidean uh, IMP colloquium of today. So um, uh, our speaker today is Frédéric Marat from the Observatoire Astronomique de Strasbourg. Welcome, Frédéric. Frédéric uh, is uh, an expert um, in radiative transfer, fair, including uh, polarization and X rays. Um, he prepared and defended his thesis in Strasbourg uh, under the supervision of René Guzman and Delphine Porto in 2013. Uh, then he spent uh, several years as a postdoc um, at Science University in Strasbourg, where he got a position at CNRS in 2019. And Frédéric Marin is a, a member of the IXP consortium, which is a SPECS NASA mission devoted to X ray polarimetry. And this is the topic of today. Thank you. Thank you. So it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you to present you the very latest results from this basically new field of astrophysics, X ray polarimetry. So everything that I will present is now uh, available on uh, science and nature. There is not any more embargoes, so I'm free to present everything uh, in this in this talk. And there are many other results that I have not allowed you to, uh, to share today, but we can have a discussion afterwards on your favorite targets. So this presentation will focus on X-ray for imagery, which is clearly a new field. And I guess most of you have never um, used for imagery and certainly not in x-rays why so from a historical purpose perspective since the beginning of the x-ray astronomy era with the launch of rockets in the 60s there has been a certain number of x-ray satellites big small but as you can see per decade you have a reasonable number of missions the mission become becoming bigger and bigger with time that's why in 2000 2010 the number of missions were lower. And now we are back to an era where we have more X-ray satellites, but of a smaller size. And if you have to guess, among those X-ray satellites that included uh, spectroscopy, photometry, timing, imaging, and polarization, how many of them carried actually an X-ray polarimeter? Well, the answer is here. There has been two X-ray parameters in the 70s on OZO-8, the solar orbiter, and IL-5. The two of them were limited to Bragg crystal diffraction, so basically a methodology to measure polarization that used crystals that have a very narrow range of, um, of capabilities. Typically, it was at 4.5 keV here, so only one energy for a measurement. And after that period, there has been 40 years without an X-ray parameter at all. There has been uh, the one parameter in space on board the Indian mission Astrosat, the CZTI, but it's a Compton scattering parameter meant for GRBs at very high X-ray uh, energies, most, mostly sub-gamma rays. And today, there is one new mission, IXP, that I will present. I'm not accounting here for the few rockets, demonstrators, and balloon, uh, balloon born experiments because they are um, rather small and they are not, uh, they did only observe one source at a time with more or less success. And uh, I have to note the very nice uh, attempts by the Integral and Resi uh, satellites. But as you can see, there was a huge gap 40 years of nothingness. So why so? Well, one of the explanations is that at the time, at the uh, end of this period, uh, 70s, 80s, there was the launch of the Einstein mission, the Einstein satellite. And the Einstein uh, satellite had a completely different technology to measure X-rays in comparison to the first uh, satellites. At the time, at the very beginning of X-ray astronomy, missions needed to rotate. The detectors needed to rotate to measure X-rays, simply put. But as um, as the launch of Einstein, the X-ray mirrors and the X-ray technology were no longer uh, in need of rotation. And that's perfect because in space, everything that rotates is fragile, expensive, and it's more complex, basically. However, black crystals need to measure the polarization in different angles, at different angles, exactly like in the optical UV with birefringent crystals. So you need rotation. 
there was a dichotomy between the two um, the two technologies, and because it was too complex, they just removed uh, X-ray perimeter on X-ray mission for decades because we needed rotation and the satellites no more. But it's sad because there has been very very few results in the past, but very nice results. First, um, I will just mention Cygnus 61, an X-ray binary with a stellar mass black hole. That has been observed by Bozoid mission, two points, as you can see, at only two energies in the soft X-ray band. And then from a balloon bound experiment here in red, the Pogo Plus mission, there is a lower limit uh, on the polarization degree. And then also a few limits and measurements by the uh, SPI and EBS. Um, instrument on bond of integral interval and it's uh okay it's very scarce there are limits but at least we see that there is an increasing an increase of polarization with energy and the polarization angle that as you, you can see because there is this this block but here there are two points of measurement with the rotation at 90 degrees so basically you see that there is something happening there is a physical mechanism that is different from the soft and the hard x -ray band. Soft, soft gamma rays. And this is very likely due this uh, this turnaround of polarization, both in degree and polarization angle, is likely due to synchrotron uh, emission from relativistic electron emissions. But it's hard to say because those are just single point measurements with many upper limits lower. Then there has been the measurement of the Crumb Nebula. The Crumb Nebula, so far, uh, uh, since last year, was the only X-ray measurement ever done with a sing, uh, more than three sigma detection. Here, 17 sigma detection, basically. And the Crème Nebula was uh, observed with the AstroSat CZT to do some phase resolve parametry. So you got the polarization degree and the polarization angle as a function of phase. And you can see the pulse in total flux and in color, the polarization degree, the polarization angle. What is interesting in this um, observation is that we see a change in polarization angle and fraction across the pulse. So we see that there is some variation, which is uh, predicted by the topo, two pole caustic and strip and wind models for particle acceleration. So to understand how you accelerate particle, at least to the X-ray band and then to higher energies. But the problem is that there is difference in polarization property between the two peaks. And there is variation of polarization in the off pulse region, which is not expected at all by the models. So it already shows us that, okay, a model based purely on spectroscopy and timing does not necessarily reproduce the expected polarization, the observed polarization. So clearly, it means that there is something that is not yet accurate in those models. And this is one of the main strengths of polarimetry. You can get new constraints on your models. But why are we not using it for polarization and basically polarization in most of the field? Because it's complicated. Well, yes, it's indeed much more complicated than pure intensity photometry uh, measurement. But the thing with the X-ray parametry, and this was this where the reason the field was dead for a long, long time, is that first, as I said, X-ray parametry needed rotation, so movable parts, more expensive, more risky to put that in space. Technologically, it was less advanced than any detector you have today. Well, because there has been 40 years of non air ED, no research and development. Well, that's logical. So we had, there was a gap in technology too. And polarized flux that we measure is a fraction of the total flux. The polarization flux is simply the polarization degree that varies between zero and one, one zero and 100%. And multiplied by the total flux. So of course, the polarized flux you measure is by definition less than the total flux. So you need longer integration time. Over the three different, um, I would say, counter agreement to use its polarization, two have been cancelled out. First, um, first and all, basically, it's in the beginning of the two year 2000, beginning of the new millennium, that Italian collaborators developed the gas mix cell detector. So it's a completely new way of measuring polarization. It's not based on black crystals at very soft energies, up to a few keV, and it's not based on the Compton scattering parameter that we use at very hard X-ray soft gamma ray energies. It's here using the photoelectric effect. Completely different, so you don't scatter. And what's happening is that you have a, 
a small chamber that contains the gas. And actually, it's presented here. It's a two centimeter per two centimeter detector. So it's really small, compact, and rather cheap to produce. So basically, you've got an incident X rays that pass through a protective uh, window that filter out all the um, uh, infrared and other smaller energy photons. And the incident X rays will simply have a photoelectric, F, um, a photoelectric uh, interaction with the gas that will produce photoelectrons, secondary, uh, tertiary photoelectrons. And what is interesting is that the direction of emission of those photoelectrons is directly linked with the polarization of the incoming photon. So what you do is just you measure the direction of your photoelectrons, and then you know what was the polarization of your incoming X ray. And to measure this, we have a pixelized uh, anode at the bottom that can record the polarization, well, not the direction of the photoelectrons, in a 2D space. And basically, this is what you got <coughs> a trace in your detector. Could you tell us why they developed this? Was it for astronomy or was it for astronomy specifically? Yes, because the uh, there is not much use of X ray polarization in. Uh, uh, in uh, this energy band for let's say particle physics they, they need a larger uh, they need polarization of much larger energy most of the time so this was made by Ocola waters and rico costa bellazzini and so on Paolo sofita and rico costa who are all astrophysicists and so basically this is a trace in x and y and as you can see you have an injection site and then a direction for all your photo and your secondary tertiary photoelectrons and what you do is that you, you just measure for a certain amount of time all the traces you got. If your signal is polarized, most of the trace will go in a certain direction. And if not, they will go in a random direction. And actually, if you measure for, I don't know, 10,000 photons, and so you integrate in 360 degrees all the direction of the traces, this is what you get. You get a sinusoidal form with the, 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 the highest completed the peak, is basically the direction of your trace. And from that, you get the polarization. How? Extremely simple. It's the, as I said, the Newton modulation. And you get this, uh, this modulation. So the polarization is simply this, this very, very simple formula here. And actually, it inter, there are two parameters that interfere B and A. B is the amplitude of your sinusoidal, it's where you have polarization. And A is the background of your detector. So what you do is that you just remove all the photons that are below this threshold, and you have a detector with zero instrumental effect, zero background noise. And it works perfectly. Actually, this is for 100 polarized radiation. And as you, as you can see on the, the right side, right hand side, this is for unpolarized radiation. You have no modulation. It's completely random in direction. So all the traces have equal probability to go uh, all um, at all fees, and then you got nothing. So you can determine how much your uh, your signal is polarized and the direction, so the polarization degree and the polarization angle. Maybe you can remove the. It's not on my screen actually. No, unfortunately. But don't worry, this part of the screen is not very important for the next uh, slides. Okay. <laughs> I just uh, want to say also because. We measure the traces in space. We have the injection point here in X and Y. So basically, here you are imaging. You have the X and Y position of your incoming photon. So you can make images also. So you can do imaging and parimetry with this single detector. And of course, because it's the, uh, this is um, sensitive to the energy of the, of the, of the uh, incoming X-ray, you have spectroscopy too. And because you are reading your pixelized anode every one microsecond, then you've got timing also for brief at one microsecond uh, rate. How big is the field? The field of you? I, I will come to that in two slides. Okay, sorry. So um, the last counter argument is the fact that you need longer integration time. And this, for the rest of my career, we will never be able to solve this because it's interesting to the, the polarization. Polarized flux are less intense than total fluxes. So now let's estimate how, many, how much integration we need in terms of time. So basically for this, we can determine the minimum detectable polarization. So the level of polarization, you are sure to measure at 99% confidence level. And basically 
This depends on a few parameters of the detector. So basically, the quantum efficiency of your detector, mu, which is 0.5 most of the time, the source, uh, the source rate, the background rate, and the total flux, the total uh, the integration time, sorry, t. So if you are in X rays, let's say you use uh, XM and Newton, and you want to detect a source, well, that's easy. You need about 10 counts. Then you need to measure the spectral slope of your source. Let's say a poor loop. 100 counts is enough. It's not perfect, but it's perfect. It's, it's enough. To reach a minimum detectable polarization of 1%, you need 700,000 counts. As you can see, it's huge. It's orders of magnitude larger. So for this very reason, it's not the best idea to plug an X-ray parameter on a new mission, on an X-ray observatory to look at a source for 700 kiloseconds uh, while the other instrument just need two kiloseconds, of course. So we needed clearly a dedicated mission, at least for opening this, this uh, new scientific window. And actually, the, the reason why we need this is that there is so much to do in X-ray polarization, and basically <laughs> in uh, gamma ray polarization too. As you can see, we have we can have four places: acceleration phenomena, emission in strong magnetic field, scattering in aspherical geometries, and fundamental physics. And you have typical sources that enter those classification. And depending on the energy, we can probe or not their uh, X-ray polarization. So then we can determine some of their properties. Below one keV, absorption is complicating everything. So most of the sources are need either not bright enough or just there is too much absorption in the line of sight or intrinsic to the source. So this was not clearly below one keV, it was not the best energy band for a demonstrator. One and 10, basically you got all your sources covered, most of them with the recent uh, decent integration time. And larger than 10 keV, most of the sources can be probed, except a few one where because of the polo emission, their sources are becoming too faint for X-ray parameter. So clearly, the 1 to 10 keV band was the, the goal of our newest mission. And this mission is IXP, the Imaging X-ray Parameter Explorer. So it's a SMEX mission, small explorer mission, that is a collaboration between NASA, who provided everything but the detectors, which are Italian made. The IXP was launched last year on December the 9th. On the uh, on the Falcon 9 rocket, so as you can see, and here and from the Kennedy Space Center, it was put on an altitude of 600 kilometers on an equatorial orbit, so that we minimize basically the um, um, we maximize the longevity of the uh, instrument, and it's not too costly to put it at 500 600 kilometers. And then we have also a zero degree inclination that minimizes the amount of time spent um, above the South Atlantic anomaly, so a region on the Earth where there is a large uh, field of charged particles which, is, which act as a background. And things which is interesting is that the X-mission has a budget cap of 244 million, basically nothing. And we managed, because we knew that we would get some cost cut, we managed to fit everything in 2,200, 200, yeah, 200 million. So with the large remaining of the envelope. And the fact is that they discovered nothing. So we were too cautious, but at least we, we got the, um, the mission we wanted in space. The only thing is that it was not meant to fly on the Falcon 9 rocket. It was meant to be launched by the US Army on board of, um, on, um, a-323, so basically a, a bombing plane that will launch a rocket, a Pegasus rocket in space, and the rocket will open and deliver the satellite. The thing is that the US Army just decided a few months after before launch that they won't do that. So we got a contract with the uh, SpaceX, and we launched this mission in the Falcon 9, and the Falcon 9 could uh, the, the size of the mission inside Falcon 9 was extremely small. So basically, we could have used for those 44 millions, if we knew it in advance, to build a much larger, basically, satellite. At least we got the mission we planned in space, and it's working very fine. 
So those are the IXP performance. You have here a picture of the satellite, and here it's, re it's realization. It's five meters long with a mass of 330 uh, kilograms. So it has a nominal lifetime of two years, but there is no consumable aboard. It's a 600 kilometers, so basically it can run for nine years, no problem. And we know that uh, we will extend this uh, lifetime to at least three years, and it's very likely to continue until the end of the mission. It's very a cheap mission in all senses uh, to, to operate. The energy band is 228 keV, and this depends on the gas mixture you put inside the, uh, the GPD. You can go at higher energies or lower energies, but you need different gas mixture. And here, what we did is that we put three times the exact same gas pixel detector for redundancy. If one fails, we have two other in space. And it was extremely important because we need as much photon as possible in a shorter uh, integration time. And we wanted to demonstrate that it works. That was extremely important. So the field of view is about 12, uh, 13 arc minutes with a resolution, spatial resolution of 28 arc second at 4.5 keV. There is, uh, as like I said, some energy resolution of spectroscopy, so half a keV at 2 keV, but this is dependent of the square root of energy and the timing possible capability of one microsecond for photometry. So this uh, has been all the uh, sources we have observed during the first year of ISP. So as you can see, we have covered almost all classes of sources, with the exception of stars, because they are not anymore bright in this energy band, and of the sun, because it will just burn up the detectors. So this would be the very last target we will observe in nine years, to kill the detector before it enters the orbit. And you can see if your favorite sources are here, but there is no mysteries. Those are all the brightest X-ray sources of each classes, almost. And most of them are uh, stable, few are transient, but uh, we wanted to, to, to go straight to the most important part. So this disclaimer is no longer, longer valid because everything has been published in Nature and Science over the past days, and weeks. And maybe you have seen that uh, last Friday, we got a NASA press release on one of the blazer measurements, actually. NASA uh, CNRS press releases plus NASA plus Italian Space Agency. So let me show you a few results. Some of those results have been presented at the sf Desar, some are new, our news. So uh, first, the classes of magnetars. Magnetars, they are basically neutron stars with an extreme magnetic field. And as you can see, it's more or less defined at, uh, with a uh, magnetic field larger than 10 to the 13 joules. And this class of objects includes sub gamma repeaters and anomalous x ray pulsars. So they are very bright, basically, in X rays, if, uh, if they, they shine, basically, because they, they are on and off. But what is important with magnetars is that because of their extreme magnetic field, they are the perfect place to prove or disprove a quantum electrodynamical effect that has been predicted by Eisenberg and Euler almost 90 years ago. And this is vacuum beer fringes. According to the theory of QED, when you reach a value larger than 4.41 uh, 10 to the 13 Gauss, so basically the, the uh, magnetic field range of magnetars, you should have your vacuum that becomes beer fringes. Basically, the uh, optical indexes of the ordinary and extraordinary uh, rays in the, of the vacuum will become different because of the strong magnetic field. So what's happening? Because uh, you have in the vacuum, the quantum vacuum, you have always a bubbling um, field of virtual pairs that are created and uh, they spontaneously appear, electron and positrons, they interact with their environment and then they join and disappear all the time. But because you have refractive indexes, which are different, it means that the particle and the, vert the vertical particle will not experience the exact same distance because of the B refringence. So there will be asymmetry, and this asymmetry will lead to polarization, and not a small polarization, actually. Here you have the flux as a function of phase for different energy, uh, energies. And as you can see, we expect some peak at a certain uh, point of phase. But most importantly, you have the second panel, which is Q over I, so particularly the polarization you expect. Uh, in uh, the Q uh, parameter of Stokes, and on the bottom line, the bottom spectrum is the polarization degree, the percentage of polarization you expect between zero and one. And as you can see, for most uh, of the cases, you expect a polarization degree 
close to 80 percent, 90 percent. It's huge. It's tremendous. Even in the synchrotron limit, we don't reach more than 70 percent. So it should be the most um, polarized source ever in the universe. So of course we wanted to measure it, and we measured the N106 record stars for you over uh, 142 plus 61 for 840 kiloseconds. Long integration time indeed. And it's one of the brightest persistent magnetars with the expected uh, spindle magnetic field that has been confirmed by synchrotron uh, frequent, uh, by um, spindle period um, of the order of 10 to the 14 goes. We should be in the range. And basically, we measure the polarization. As you can see, we got a very high significant detection. The four different uh, detectors, the sum of them, and some expected heating. Everything tends to show us that in between two and eight keV, the position agrees on the other twelve percent plus or minus plus or minus one. So it's extremely disappointing because vacuum field fringes cannot be proved at all. Actually, it's not that it disproves it, but at least either we are not in the the estimation of the spin down magnetic field is wrong, or there are some other uh, some other things that happen, that is happening. But it's not here. It should be here. It's not. So we cannot prove. Uh, vacuum refringent with the with this observation. Okay, what can we do? Well, we could look at the energy dependent polarization, and this is represented here: the polarization degree as a function of the angle of your polarization. And as you can see, between three and uh, two and four keV, <laughs> the polarization degree is uh, of the order of fourteen percent, with a, a specific polarization angle forty eight uh, degrees. And then in the energy band 4 to 5.5 here, we, we've got nothing. We've got zero polarization at all, undetected. And afterwards, in the high energy band of ISP, 5.5 to 8 keV, we've got a polarization degree that reached 40%. But most importantly, the polarization angle is completely different. It's orthogonal to the, the previous one, to the soft band. So this explains actually why you have a non-detection between 4 and 5.5. It's because polarization being a vectorial quantity, when you have two orthogonal vectors, they simply come set out in polarization. So you have zero polarization because it's, a, it's a, the transition between the one mode to the other mode. So it's extremely important because the resonant Compton scattering scenario is the main scenario to explain the X-ray emission from magnetars. And in this case, we believe that thermal photons from the cooling star entire surface, this is important, um, contribute to the soft X-ray emission. And they are this uh, soft X-ray emission are upscattered by Compton inverse scatter, uh, scattering uh, by charged particles along the uh, closed field line in a twisted magnetic field, basically. So this will give rise then to the uh, high energy emission. And the prediction from this scenario is that we have the X mode at high energy, which produces about 35% polarization degree. This is well within what we measure. But the problem is that the O mode, so the orthogonal mode at low energy, okay, that's, that's good too. The thing is that it should be either inferior to 10% in the case of condensed surface due to magnetic condensation, or it should be larger than 50% in the case of a gaseous extended atmosphere heating from below. And it's not what we observe in neither case. So there is something, again, wrong or incomplete, I would say, about this scenario. So we push forward the uh, investigation and we look at the spectral shape as a function of the phase. And there is no significant changes in this uh, spectral shape as a function of phase. So what does it mean? It means that if you have a scenario where you have emission from only a small polar region, because of the rotation of your uh, magnetar, you should see it sometimes, and then it should be hidden or partially hidden because of the, the GR effect. So you would expect variation in the spectral shape. It's not what we see. So basically, this absence of variation tells us that it can, the, the source of X-ray emission cannot come from a, a region that is just punctual, small on the polar cap or equator or whatever. And then we look at the polarization angle. It varies in the phase, but it does not vary from zero to 90 degrees. So it means, what does it mean? It means that if we have variation, it means that we have an extended region, but not too extended because if it covered the full surface, it, there should be no variation at all of polarization because of the symmetry, spherical symmetry of your system. So we know it's not 
contour, but it's not extended over the whole surface of the magnetron. So what is the solution? We run many new simulations, uh, 3D simulation magnetosomal evolution. And what fits the best the data is a region for responsible for the emission of its rays that is along the magnetic equator, which is composed of hot iron in the belt. And this produces all the expected uh, temporal photometric spectroscopic and polarization signal. This is what you, uh, you can see here uh, for the observation. So it's a, it's a step forward. Of course, it's only one observation, and we are currently doing the second observation of magnetar, but we're waiting for the sources to be bright enough. So a new magnetar will be observed and will be able to confirm or, or at least to check if vacuum refringence appears or not. And we will do statistics in some sometimes in the future because one two sources is not enough. But we'll see if it works or not. Then uh, lasers. Lasers. Uh, most of you know these. Lasers are basically active reactive nuclei, very bright, with jet is directly pointed at us toward the Earth. And in the jet, there is some particle acceleration that can produce most likely uh, uh, cosmic rays. And it's not the only uh, possible origin of cosmic rays, but it's one of them. And actually, we don't know the mechanisms that energize the radiating particles. This is a completely uh, unknown. So we, of course, wanted to look at it because they are bright and actually they are punctual in the, in the sky. Here you are Mark and 501 and the most famous uh, blazer, BLLAC, BLLACERTAI. So the thing is that, as I said, we don't know how to energize the uh, particles because we don't know the ratio of matter and antimatter. There is a diversity, there is a diversity in emission mechanisms among the blazers. You have a uh, high cyclotron peak and low cyclotron peak. So basically your cyclotron uh, part of the ECD peaks either in the infrared or in the UV, low and high energy peak. So why is there a difference between those blazers? And this we don't know. And we don't know neither the, order, the orientation and the order, the turbulence of the magnetic field in the jet. The thing is that precision is a vectoral quantity. So it gives you any information that is geometric. So the direction of your jet, this is something, the direction, sorry, of the magnetic field in the jet can be proved by parametry. And the thing is that there are several models uh, in the, for jets that can uh, explain the emission of soft, uh, of X-rays and gamma rays. Among them, uh, among them, four are the, are very popular. The one is the, the first one is a single zone model, extremely simple. You have a beta a jet that is constant in density, and uh, with the magnetic uh, plus well, uh, a plasmoid with partially ordered or helicoidal magnetic field that accelerate particle along the full jet. Then you can refine a bit the model, but uh, here you have turbulent magnetic fields with magnetic core connections. Uh, when contiguous region of open directed magnetic fields just come into contact. So then you have an acceleration and production of X rays, gamma rays, and other um, web, um, other energies of photons. And you have energy stratified particles, uh, a bit more complex model, but also much more realistic, very likely indeed, where you have um, the particles become energized at different, um, at different distances from the base of the jet by either magnetic reconnections or shocks. We don't know yet. So first, what is the, the, the way, in, what is the methodology, the physical process to accelerate your shocks, your, your X-rays? And also what is interesting is that after this shock of magnetic reconnections, the electron will lose energy to radiation and emit at longer and longer, uh, at a decreasing frequency, longer wavelengths. So all models have very specific signatures in polarization expected. As you can see, single zone with zone energy stratified with shock or magnetic reductions have a chromaticity, either constant or strongly or not. So basically, the variation of polarization as a function of energy or wavelengths. It has variation in polarization, slow, high, moderate. So within a few hours, within a few days, within a few weeks. And the polarization angle is also different because, uh, between the different models because of the physical processes themselves. So we look at Mark and 501, 
for twice actually at the beginning of the year for 186 kiloseconds. It's a BL like a blazar, very famous, extremely bright in the gamma ray energy band. This is a um, IXP observation, so a point like as expected. And the polarization we measure, the two points, the two different periods, agree within each other. Within each other. They're basically, the polarization degree is about 10% plus or minus two. And the polarization angle which, um, is uh, parallel to the radio jet. The radio jet is in dash line. Okay. And actually, between the two, there is a bit of variability, but not strong. And there was no variability during the observation. It's just a few uh, small variability uh, between the two epochs. We make sure of this. We observed, because we needed the chromaticity, at the exact same time, the uh, polarization from the um, radio millimetric band to the um, to the optical band um, infrared optical band. What we found is that the polarization degree increases with uh, higher frequencies, and the polarization angle stay constant at all energy bands, all wavelength bands, and actually it's always aligned with the jet axis. So we just put the Sherlock Holmes hat. And uh, we just look at the, the proofs, the indices, the um, everything you need to, to check if your model is correct or not. And basically, if you put all the, in the, uh, all the clues together, you see that only the energy stratified uh, jets can reproduce the strong chromaticity, the slow variability, and the polarization uh, angle that is along the jet axis. And actually, this is extremely interesting because it, uh, it proves in Markant 501 that shocks are responsible for the production of X rays and very likely sub gamma rays. But also, it helps uh, to determine the um, magnetic orders, basically the, the topology of the, of the magnetic field close to the uh, acceleration, acceleration site. We reproduce the same result, not shown here, for BLAC and other um, uh, well, Markant 421 and other high synchrotron peak, and we always find the same results. All of them, all high synchrotron peak blazars have exactly the same behavior. Low synchrotron peak blazar have non-detected polarization. So there is something very different between those two classes of blazars. Then supernova remnant. So supernova remnant are another perfect place for particle accelerations. And actually, this is a very nice uh, work by Harmonian and 2006 et al. So you have here the Hess and so gamma rays and ASCA X rays <laughs> superposition of images of uh, in the um, in this supernova remnant. Not pronounced. <laughs> the fact is that when you have the two regions, the X ray and the gamma ray region, which overlap in terms of uh, <laughs> peak of intensity means that those regions are probable, probable site for electron acceleration due to inverse Compton scattering. <laughs> your X rays are the progenitors of your gamma rays. And they, they, this happen at the same position in space, same site. However, if it's decorrelated, then the hard X ray emissions of gamma rays most likely comes from adron acceleration. So here, neutral pion decay from proton proton accelerations. So you see, there are different possibilities for accelerating uh, for production of soft of uh, hard X-rays and gamma rays, and all of them are based on the interaction, the emission at lower energies, soft X-rays. Sorry, can I invite the minutes? Should be fine. So the idea is that we wanted to look at the supernova remnant with X-ray polarization, in particular, thanks to imaging. Because we know that supernova remnants are strong source of radio synchrotron radiation, we observe them, we see a polarization in the radio, very fine, caused by relativistic electrons. And they are expected, well, basically, they have been proven in the past that they are accelerated by diffusive shock acceleration. So we have non thermal, very specific spots in the supernova remnant uh, outer shell or shell to accelerate particles and produce X rays. And what is interesting is that. Here is the simulation of the envelope, the shell of a supernova remnant in total flux. And this is the uh, polarization degree resulting from the interaction, acceleration of, uh, well, inner, um, either interaction, acceleration of particles and photons. And you can see you have some blobs here of high polarization degree. So where this is happening. 
And actually, if you look at the polar flux, which is the multiplication of the two, you increase the contrast of your uh, image by a uh, um, two orders of magnitude. So you can directly spot where are the acceleration sites. So of course, it was clearly one of the things we wanted. And in addition, we measuring the position grid tells you the turbulence of the magnetic field and the position angle tells you the direction of it. So we look at Cassiopeia for one megasecond, a young and bright collapsed supernova situated very nearby, whose uh, synchrotron, whose uh, radio synchrotron polarization has been measured. So we expected some polarization. And here you have IXPLIS plus Chandra images, which are very, um, with, which both correspond. And if you are the SF design, you know that this was a huge disappointment for us. This is the polarization map. And you see all black pixels are no polarization at all. Colored pixels are where you, we detect polarization degree. And here between basically 5% and 20%. And the two pixels with the vector are where we find polarization degree at at least three sigma continuous seven. So basically, overall, the uh, polarization is new or very small, 1.8%. And uh, there is basically nothing. We, we don't see acceleration side. We don't see polarization while it was expected. <coughs> we, of course, did a pixel by pixel search for polarization. And as, as I said, three sigma continuous level, only two, um, only two detections. And the, um, the polarization angle tells us that the magnetic field topology could be um, um, radial, uh, tangential, sorry, tangential. So what we, we believe is that the, uh, there is very strong turbulence on scales that are smaller than the physical scale of each pixel. So less than 10 to the cent, uh, 17 centimeters. So you have a lot of turbulence, so a lot of depolarization. And then uh, the thing is that shock compression should increase, uh, impose a tangential magnetic field. And uh, we believe that because we see this, um, because we see this very little um, proof for the ma uh, magnetic topology and basically nothing in the world's one of our remnants, there should be also some rearrangement of the magnetic field within 10 to the 17, less than that centimeter from the, uh, from the shock. So overall, the X-ray polarization tells us that nothing is exactly what we expected in the, the supernova remnant. And basically, we need a much larger, uh, much better spatial resolution in order to probe the acceleration side. And this was not predicted by our models. What do you mean by topology here? The topology, basically, the orientation of the magnetic field, the, the global orientation. Is it more or less circular? Is it more radial? So this is something we wanted, we expected to see very clear, very precisely, and no, because the in one pixel we have too much uh, of information, too much vectors from different uh, regions of, of shocks, and all of them produce a slightly different polarization degree and polarization angle. They cancel out pixel by pixel. So we need a larger spatial resolution. So now the latest, the the latest, the latest, uh, yeah, latest and um, final slide on Cygnus six one, the X-ray binary I showed you previously. So we observed it for two hundred and forty two seconds, and as I said, it's a bright and persistent X-ray source. We put it in the R state, and it it has a twenty one solar masses black hole that orbits a forty solar masses uh, star, and it's a two kiloparsecs. So we measured uh, the polarization and, of course, the, the total flux of uh, Sigma 61 with IXP. So this is uh, in gray. And actually, we also use NICER, we use New Star, and Integral. So basically, we cover the full X-ray band. And it, it is especially important to get, actually, the end of the Compton hump here. Because with this, with this, this amount of information, we can reproduce a model. The best fit model here is in black, solid line. And it is composed of um, the uh, thermal emission here with the dots. We have a contonization. We have totalization. We have then reflection onto the disk far away from the uh, um, inner radius of the black hole and close from the inner radius of the black hole. Simply here, you have a strong um, GR effect that is smearing the lines. And here you are far away, so you don't have this uh, 
sparing an effect from the general relativity. We measure the polarization, which is basically here, the Q and U, and they are both not equal to zero and different from each other. So clearly, there is some polarization detected. And actually, we measured the position at more than 20 sigma. It was much more than what we expected. And we find a polarization that is also dependent, as you can see, on energy. The polarization degree rises with energy up to six, seven percent, with a, a, a small drop of polarization at 6.4 keV, where you have emission from the iron line, which is unpolarized by Celsius, fluorescent emission. What is interesting is that the polarization angle here coincides with the direction of the radio jet. So basically, it supports the uh, scenario where the jet is launched perpendicular to the accretion flow. And the X-ray emission also should be, um, the, the polarization angle tells us that, and the, the polarization degree, so basically the, um, the shape of the corona can be determined. The corona basically is the region around black holes that is of a completely unknown origin shape. And we measure more or less thanks to the Compton Hubbard's temperature, but we don't know the ratio of matter, antimatter inside, or composition, basically. And it's, uh, this region should be really responsible for uh, production of X rays. But again, we don't know where is, it, where is it formed, how is it formed, how it, it uh, sustains its geometry over time, what is the geometry of it. So it's, it's a big, big question around accreting black holes. Small black holes, but supermassive black holes too. And there are several models. The most famous model has been proposed by Andy Fabian um, decades ago, and it is extensively used in AGNs and most also a lot in uh, X-ray binaries. And this is the lamp loss model. So basically, you have the accretion disk, the black hole at the center, and you have this cloud of uh, high um, temperature electrons that is situated on the spin axis of the black hole. It's basically a lamp post, a sphere. And actually, this, uh, this model that is, as I said, extensively used, when you do simulations, they, uh, they have a polarization degree, which is rather small, a few percent. And the polarization angle actually is opposite, orthogonal to the one we measure. So basically, polarization measurement disprove this model that we are we have been using for decades to estimate the spin of black holes, especially in AGNs. Then we you can you can think of this um, of this corner to be the base of the jet, basically. But then you still have a polar you have the polar elongation, and you have a uh, geometry that is inconsistent, as you can see with the polarization angle we measure. Position being here, it's it's still incorrect. <laughs> However, the second class of, of models is the uh, the corona that is situated along the equatorial plane of your system. Either it's on top and below the um, the accretion disk, so it's a sandwich corona, it's an atmosphere, or it could be also the result of a truncated disk. You have a disk which is truncated. And you have here maybe strong magnetic effect or something else that produce this uh, this corona be, uh, between the ESCO and uh, the uh, the truncated disk radius between the event horizon basically and the truncated disk radius. And you can have here emission from this uh, region either thanks to Comptonization or Sigurdsson self Compton. Two different scenarios. So you you do this modeling, and this is a zoom in. You see that all those models with the equatorial distribution of your corona, produce the expected polarization degree and polarization angle for a certain range of inclination. So by doing so, we are able to have an independent measurement of the inclination of the disk and corona system. And we actually disprove completely this, um, this model. And this has been done for Sigma 6 one but I'm not allowed to show you the other XRBs we have observed, but it's confirmed in all of them. <laughs> so the thing is that we are able to uh, completely uh, put a discrepancy between the models we use. And what is interesting also is that the inclination derived from this method is in opposition, in, in contradiction with the inclination of the binary orbit. It's a bit problematic because in a, in a multiple body system, such as, the, um, such as the solar system, you expect the different bodies 
to uh, orbit along around the same spin axis mostly so it means that there is clearly here if this is correct or this is correct then it means that there is some spin misalignment between the black hole itself and the orbit of the binary so those are the results I was uh, I'm very happy to have shown you we have more than uh, six sigma detection of quite a few sources a few more now that have been um, that are not missing here and in 10 months of experience uh, with a conclusion that did not change since the SF does that, the magnetic universe is more polarized and stranger than what was expected and other sources are which are basically the thermal um, universe are less polarized than expected it is extremely important to uh, to do some um, uh, to basically exploit the results to have both uh, spectroscopy and timing from other X-ray satellites to reduce the number of degree of freedoms in fitting with XPEC, XPEC models, but also to have the chromaticity, so basically multi-wavelength uh, polarization for the same source at the same time. No 50% of the nominal two years mission targets have been observed, so there are again about 50 more sources that will come next year that we have already a list of. And starting from year three, so beginning of 2024, IXP will become an observatory. Now it's a closed consortium that we will open the mission to anyone in the community with, um, with observing time proposals, and it will be strongly uh, advocated to have basically uh, copy a COI, copy I of the um, of the XP mission within the team, because data reduction is not easy. It's rather complex. All reprocessed data are almost immediately available at ESARC. But uh, to be fair, good luck with reducing the data by yourself if you have no experience. It's really not easy. It's easy to make mistakes. But at least we are paving the way for the Enos X-ray timing and parameter mission, the Chinese led mission that will fly in the horizon 2730, uh, 2027, uh, which will carry um, the same X-ray parameters with a uh, with a much larger um, uh, effective array. So we'll gain a factor seven in sensitivity at the very least. And then we are already pay, uh, working on future mission XL calibers and others to basically make uh, X-ray polarization measurements in the full X-ray band. And this is also the beginning of, uh, we hope, of gamma ray parameter, which is essential for gamma ray burst and other systems. So thank you for attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an early question. Uh, you didn't mention polarization at the wavelength. I guess some of the source must have polarized data in radio wavelengths. Yes. Or not, or? Most, uh, if, uh, all of them have polarization at different wavelengths. Yes. The thing is that it depends on the characteristic of the source, uh, especially in the radio. You got synchrotron radiation, mostly from jets, if you have jet in the source. And in X rays, you either probe the jet also, but the mechanism that, that uh, energizes the, the uh, photons to the X-rays, or you probe a different phenomenon, such as in uh, Cygnus 6 one in this state, we probe the corona. And this is what we use also for AGNs. We look at AGNs, radio quiet and radio loud. And in both cases, we don't look at the same thing with X-ray polarization. Are there any UV polarization measurements? Mm -hmm. or? This is a very good question because um, I'm not doing only X-ray polarization, but actually I'm working on polarization from all wavelengths. And I have a specific um, UV polarization is extremely important. And there has been no UV parameter for 30 years about now. The last one was the Wisconsin University experiment, the WHOOP experiment that was on board of um, uh, what was that? Um, it was on ah, put onto the Columbia missions, the, um, the the spacecraft. So we got no UV parameter. We we got a few. I would say like the VLT Force Two, Force Two has a, a small UV window, and of course you can look at very far distant sources such as uh, distant quasars to have the the UV polarization, but it's time consuming. We, today, there is no longer far UV or mid UV 
for a limiter. And actually, it's, it's extremely complete. It's extremely sad because there is a lot to do. And we're working with uh, Stéphane Charlot and uh, Coralie Niner, actually, to put a uh, UV polymeter on board of the future Pollux, um, uh, future Louvoir uh, mission. Uh, the, it's the UV parameter calls uh, Pollux. And I, I will jump on this just to make a complaint also. <laughs> because the app before we got a UV parameter on board of HST. HST at the beginning had five instruments. Over the five instruments, three of them were parameters. Today we launched GWST, zero parameter. And we have zero infrared parameter and vision for the next for the, the next decades. There is only the Sofia Oak parameter uh, that fly onto an uh, energy once every uh, month, two months, something like that. So we have three, actually three windows that will lack polarization measurement in the in the very close future. Infrared, I would say far infrared, mean infrared, there is nothing anymore in within the next decade. UV, same thing. And uh, X-rays is just the opening, but the gamma ray is yet to be opened to polarization measurement. Yes, I have two questions. One is uh, for this X-ray binary. Can you explain the direction of polarization in this SSC model that you mentioned last? Is it easy to understand? Direction here? Yes. Of polarization in this case? Well, uh, the plasma here would emit uh, synchrotron polarization and the from inverse Compton, you know, but I'm just uh, summarizing for everyone. From, and then there will be inverse Compton scattering that we produce the polarization uh, we observe in X-rays. And the thing is that because of the geometry of the system, scattering will mainly occur along the equatorial plane. And the polarization angle that will emerge from it will keep this uh, favorite plane of scattering in memory. And this will imprint the, uh, the polarization angle. That for this very reason, any scattering within the first 30 degrees of opening angle will produce always a polarization angle that is here uh, perpendicular to the jet and here for a polar direction source, which is basically 30 degrees also half opening angle from the polar direction, the, it will be completely the opposite polarization angle. So it's very geometric. Thank you. The second question is, have you observed uh, one source that you plotted, one ESO 229, which is an extreme blazer. Okay, here, the bottom left, this one. So, I'm not sure we have yet observed this source. Um, what I can do is that after this, I can check the, the log of, uh, of observation. I will tell you when it was observed, if it was yet observed, or when it will be observed within the next months. But from the regular meeting we have, if we observe the source, it had, I, I think it, if, it, if, if it was observed, it's among the sources with zero polarization detected. Because I don't remember any discussion about these sources with a specific polarization. But I will check this afterwards. I will let you know. Uh, one about uh, what you have shown about the uh, blazar. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what is the scale uh, you probe with this measurement for the geometry of the magnetic field? The problem is it's not about the scale because the jet is pointed directly at us. We see the wall basically integrate over the wall jet. So we um, we cannot give a scale for the uh, where actually the shock is happening at the very base of the jet or the parsec or 10 parsecs away. This we cannot uh, so far with the results we have. But the point of view of the photons, the photons. That produce extra, the, 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 part, the electrons producing these photons are already well outside the like, ocean side. No? Well outside, no. The question is to know if it's more representative of the, the region itself. Where, 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 ah, okay. No. Uh, okay. No, no, no. no. Uh, this, okay. Then uh, the answer is simple. The When you have shock, 
you have a compression of, uh, of the medium, and then the X-rays are directly emitted. They are the freshest uh, photons you get, and then, then you get the UV optical infrared. So by measuring the X-ray polarization, you are at the region of the jet, not at of the shock itself. So it's uh, you probe the very, very first instance itself. Other question on the Zoom? Or? No, 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 no. Okay, so there is no urgent question. Then uh, we thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.